thank you all for joining us for the battle it, the battle of the authoring tools a 10 point comparison for picking the right one presented by e-learning learning and sponsored by elb learning i'm rayvon the webinar coordinator of e-learning learning and i'm so excited to bring you this new session about 10 considerations that will guide your authoring tool decision i'm really looking forward to speaking with chris paxton mcmillan and what i'm sure will be a fascinating and amusing conversation as a reminder, we are recording today's session just in case any of you have to leave early. If you miss any episodes in this series, you can go to the series page to access them. We are sending the series link to the chat box right now. Up next, before we go any further, I do want to thank ELB Learning for sponsoring this webinar series and helping us to make it happen. ELB Learning offers the most comprehensive suite of products and services worldwide to ensure businesses distribute more immersive and impactful learning. As a market leader, ELB Learning creates and delivers turnkey and custom learning solutions, including e-learning, gamification, virtual reality, video practice and coaching, staff augmentation, and courseware. Today, 80% of Fortune 100 companies trust ELB Learning to elevate their corporate learning experiences. Thanks again, ELB Learning. Up next, let's go ahead and get some technical things out the way for everybody. Please feel free to ask questions throughout today's session. You can do so by submitting your questions into the questions panel on the right side of your screen. My wonderful colleague, Tori, will be fielding your questions today. She'll be happy to answer anything you might have, so pull up the questions panel and say hello to let her know that you're listening. Lastly, if you have any audio issues during today's presentation, you may choose to dial in by phone. You can do so by selecting the more button in the upper right portion of your screen and then select the switch to phone option. Up next, today we are gonna be hearing from Chris McMillan. Chris McMillan, president of D3 Training Solutions, has over 30 years of experience in training and development and human resources, having worked in publishing, sales, telecommunications, oil and gas, transportation, gaming, entertainment, hospitality, and manufacturing. For the last 20 years, her focus has been on the three Ds of D3 Training Solutions, designing, developing, and delivering courses. Chris graduated from Oklahoma State University with two degrees, an MS in Adult and Occupational Education with a focus on distance learning, and a BS in Journalism News Editing. She has been an adjunct business and information technology faculty member at Tulsa Community College since December 2000. She is also a volunteer with the Lectora Assess Accessibility User Group. Chris currently lives in Oklahoma with her husband and dogs, whom she fondly refers to as her IT support team. And with that, let me step out of the way and pass it over to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Rayvon. And uh, when you say those years, I try to actually use the years instead of how many of the years add up. It doesn't sound so much, but uh, hello, everyone. My preferred name is Chris. I am a 54-year-old white female. I wear glasses. I have graying blonde hair, and my pronouns are she and her, and has mentioned I am not only in Oklahoma, I am in rural Oklahoma. So a couple things. Um, because of that, the digital divide or lack of broadband internet is alive and well. So I'm sharing my camera now, but if it gets a little wonky or slows down, I will turn that off um, just because I want to make sure we can keep up with the session. And I want to thank you all for being here, for ELB Learning, for sponsoring the session, and Rayvon and Tori for moderating it and taking care of all those technical issues for us. As mentioned, I've been in the HR training and development field since 98, and in 2000, I actually taught my first course via distance learning, which is that old term. Um, and let me tell you, it has been amazing to see the changes and development and how it's all evolved and really is still evolving. Authoring tools, though, have actually been around for over 20 years, and every tool actually has its own benefits and drawbacks. Nevertheless, when you're responsible for achieving business results, it's really hard to execute that winning blueprint when you are limited by your authoring tool. So you hear a lot of stuff out there saying, uh, people saying something is hard or easy, and I will first start by saying it is a huge pet peeve of mine when people say something is easy because that is so relative. Um, at 54 years old, I think walking is easy, but I didn't, obviously, when I was, you know, a baby or a toddler. Um, I also think ice skating is easy, and doing some of those basic single jumps and spins are pretty easy, but a back handspring would be difficult, and I bet if we checked with some people on the line in the chat, they would probably be like, oh, no, you're crazy. Uh, ice skating is hard. So, um, you know, it's just, it's really relative. 
For my basic research, many people who refer to a tool as easy or hard really have only used one tool, and they're just repeating what they have heard other people say. So to let you know, in addition to being in this field, what seems like forever, um, I own uh, licenses and actually have them installed on my computer now to what I refer to as the big three authoring tools that we're going to talk about today. And I've used them for anywhere between seven and, as mentioned, um, 20 years. <laughs> So let's uh, go on. While pretty pictures and slides are really nice, they are rarely enough to really move that training bar. So the quality of our learning really can directly impact profitability and business outcomes. And there, again, are lots of authoring tools on the market. So it's extremely important to consider your workplace learning needs and performance goals when you're selecting software for your organization. Because this is where, what well, I love PowerPoint, and this was developed, this portion in PowerPoint, it just doesn't quite cut it. While there are many, again, great authoring tools to develop e-learning, they vary widely in focus, approach, strengths, weaknesses, skill level, time constraints, and price are normally typical factors, but what else do you need to know? And how do you know if your tool will help you achieve the best outcomes? And again, what if your project or your development needs and priorities change over time or even from project to project, which is I have all three. Uh, today we're going to focus on what I consider the 10 key considerations that will help you choose the right tool to meet your organizational learning and performance objectives using only out-of-the-box features. So if there are other ways to enhance the functionality of a tool, and we know that there are, uh, we're actually looking at that. We're just going to look at what the tool itself does, well, except for consideration seven, where we actually do look at how the tools can be enhanced. Uh, so before we get started, I would like to get to know you all a little bit better. So Ravon is, Ravon is going to ask you the first question. And that is, what area do you primarily work? Now, I'm guessing almost everybody on the call works in one of the areas of employee and training and development, but curious to see the specific areas or departments. So you're instructor-led, maybe wanting to get into e-learning, instructional design, um, e-learning, and some people may refer to this technical writing, again, that's kind of the old term, uh, e-learning development, HR, other departments. Mm, nose is itching. And sharing those poll results, and it looks like, wow, a vast majority of you all are in that instructional design, following with the e-learning development, so fantastic, great. Okay. Well, again, just to preface, I own and use all three of these tools depending on what I'm doing and what my clients want. And I really want to give a big thank you. I always start this out uh, going to the support teams at Adobe, who are the creators of Captivate, Articulate Global, who are the creators of Storyline 360, and ELB Learning, the creators of Lectora. I really appreciate all the responses to my emails and phone calls Everyone was great at answering question after question after question and or putting me in touch with the people who could answer my questions. And this review would not be possible without them. And just kind of an FYI at the end, if you're taking notes, uh, you will have access to my full ebook. And I don't remember how many pages it is. It's 10 considerations. So it's probably, I'm guessing, maybe 30 something pages. You'll have access to that free ebook. Now, when I've given this session uh, one other time when we were kind of debuting and practicing people would ask why I didn't include RISE in here which is again an articulate global product and that's because there's really no way it RISE could really compete in several of the categories that we're looking at because that's just not really the goal and the purpose of RISE uh, again they all have their particular strengths and what I'm looking at today it just it, it, it wouldn't um, it, not many anyway we're not including RISE. So these are the three we're looking at. Okay, I have another question here for Yvonne could go ahead and launch it. As I'm curious about what your experience actually is and what I consider, again, these top three e-learning tools, Captivate, Storyline, and Lector, and Storyline primarily 360 versus Storyline 3. And I also want to do a bit of disclaimer, as Captivate is in the middle of an upgrade, so part of this is Captivate uh, 19 that I go over, and part of it is the all-new Captivate, 
which actually hasn't been released yet. It's still under the uh, code name of Project Charm. And I'm curious if anyone else is on the debut team with Project Charm, because it's actually been really fun. And by experience, using one, using two, or using three, and again, by experience, I mean three to six months working with or in the tool. As most tools, it does take a little while to get into the meat of the tool and get really comfortable with it. Uh, it looks like the majority just has with one tool. We've got a couple, or I can't quite see that, 27% uh, with two uh, other tools. Okay, great. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all for sharing. So my goal for this session and the accompanying, again, ebook that you'll have access to is that it will help you with some tips, again, on choosing or continuing to choose uh, the right authoring tool. So why do we even need an authoring tool? Well, when we think about distance learning, and I prefer that term because I think it is more accurate, the first generation of distance learning uh, or distance education was actually defined by print technology. Although there's been examples for hundreds uh, of years, it was really the combination of the printing press technology and postal services that made what most refer to way back when has a correspondence course widely available, which I think there's a few I haven't finished yet. This also evolved into a video correspondence course, which I really know I haven't finished my history one from 1989. Um, because many of these really, why they were great and offering new opportunities here in the United States, they really did have poor completion rates. So again, why? One of the reasons though is reduced cost. One of the most obvious benefits of e-learning is a reduction in cost when compared to traditional training methods. In-person training can be expensive. Uh, add in paying for the instructor, travel time, time off work, even the cost of the physical training materials like those workbooks, and it's really easy to see how e-learning is much more cost effective. We also have a challenge with engagement and retention. E-learning can definitely be effective, and it's often the perfect delivery method for materials where a learner can either check out a graphic, watch a video, share a clip online, instead of maybe reading pages of text or sitting through a training presentation. We know when learners are engaged, their retention actually increases. We also know that switching from face-to-face -face training to e-learning or any type of blended solution can not only reduce or eliminate travel costs, it can reduce or eliminate the inconsistencies created by having multiple facilitators. So again, using that authoring tool to build e-learning can help you deliver constant easy up-to-date learning content for your entire organization, boosting productivity, increasing employee retention, and really allowing you to accommodate all of your learner needs. So one question uh, that I'm going on here, and this next, my first consideration, strangely enough, is often considered controversial, <laughs> um, which is what are the training requirements? Once you start with a solid instructional design strategy, should everything be an e-learning course, and I'm gonna tell you no. And that's where it can get controversial because a lot of people, I don't know, it has to be e-learning. Yeah, I don't agree with that. More and more people are getting into the training, learning, development field, which is great, and creating ever more e-learning products and solutions, but before you choose an authoring tool, it's really important to understand the needs and requirements of your specific training project. And this is where a needs analysis and or task analysis is beneficial. What are the outcomes that you want this training to accomplish? How are you going to show that they actually met that goal? Once you understand the business training needs that are actually required, you can decide if a job aid, such as different instructions, maybe a checklist, a flow chart, or even an instructional poster in the break room will actually meet those learner needs. Now, this is a pretty huge generalization that I'm going to give, but in my mind, in my thought, I always think that if you legally need to track if the user completed the training, then it probably needs to be e-learning, okay? If it's just something that it's nice to know, you're not gonna go to employment court on, and I promise you that is not fun, uh, then maybe it could be some type of job aid. So once you have that clear understanding of your project, the e-learning tool features and capabilities can then be reviewed to ensure it really meets your needs. So consideration two. 
very much like a learning management system, the administration features of your software can be a huge time saver, no matter if you manage a team or if it's just yourself. In what I refer to as the olden days, um, I actually had to keep a spreadsheet of information so I could manage our 15 employees and their software, plus we had a mobile lab of 48 laptops. Very challenging. Organization administration of all users and the tools actually refers to, again, that flexibility as an administrator to easily manage all the users within your organization. If you have that flexibility, it can, again, save you lots of time, uh, more so than managing some type of separate spreadsheet. Administrators need to know how many licenses they currently have, who's using those licenses, what software or role is available to each user. I've actually, several times a year, I get calls from clients. Now, do we give you this particular license because they're in the middle of the renewal and they need to know if they need to count my headcount? And I'm like, nope, I've, I've got my own licenses. Individual administration now also gives the users the ability to navigate the tool so let me get over there, uh, and the ability to utilize features and functionalities the way that works best for them. It gives the user the flexibility of a single sign-on, along with having the flexibility to set up their personal preferences, enabling the ability to set up a tool, uh, and so forth. And as we can see, these are just the different logins of the three. So we've got Captivate, Articulate, and uh, Lectora. So, so pretty much all three meets that. We also, though, so we talked about single sign-on. What about the workspace? Adjusting the workspace with movable windows, having a variety of tools, dockable panels, being able to view and preview in multiple modes, and enable auto-recovery for these technical issues that are going to happen are all time-saving features. All three of these tools actually allow you to do a variety of resizing, moving, hiding, um, Lector and Storyline actually allow you to move a panel out of the tool itself onto another monitor, which I find very helpful. The other one would be collaboration. And again, it's just kind of screenshots. Again, we've got Articulate, uh, Storyline, and Lectora, three different courses um, that I've developed that I'm not uh, showing, violating any NDAs on. Uh, we also have collaboration, and this can be really important as many projects involve more than one instructional designer or e-learning developer. Aside from your SMEs or your subject matter experts, a lot of times organizations have a team developing a course or larger curriculum, and those individuals or teams still need to be able to complete the project on time, and their authoring tools should enable them to collaborate authoring, again, multiple authors. One of the things I do love about Lectora Online is when I'm working with a team is we now have the ability and you can kind of see on here we can see open projects so again recently uh, we have the ability to check in and check out a project okay so again multiple people could be working on it in addition to sharing things such as their media libraries and library objects not necessarily just in a shared drive it's actually shared within the software itself. Consideration three is one that is very near and dear to my heart and is what I speak on a lot of, which is accessibility. Making sure that everyone can take, let's get that going here, uh, your e-learning course is at the heart of accessibility. In order to respect the different audiovisual sensory needs of individuals, accessibility features can change or uh, can change or add on screen elements, interactions, can turn them off, formatting, things like that. I really like that Captivate and Lectora both offer accessibility settings options available to me. And once I have those checked, that will help me to meet those Section 508 standards or WCAG, your Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0 Level AA. <laughs> Excuse me. Has April. Uh, of 2023, Storyline actually says they are making strides and does have an optional player property settings with accessibility controls. But I have reviewed those with a screen reader and with uh, accessibility users um, to see how it works and which is the most efficient tool to build in. And it's still a bit challenging. With these, with accessibility settings, you can do things like you always publish alt tags or it can automatically turn them off. You can adjust whoops, let me get that going there, uh, your alt tags. You can adjust your reading order, or in Storyline, it's referred to as a custom focus order. And this is something that many people 
when I work on consulting, they're like, oh, wait, we didn't realize we could even make those adjustments. And you definitely can. You have to open up a new window in Storyline to do so and in uh, Articulate, which we've got screenshots here, uh, but you can make those adjustments. Whereas one of the reasons I prefer building accessible courses in Lectur is it's all right there at the same spot. I'm not actually maneuvering in two different areas. So are you just using the defaults in how you build it? And again, this is a huge consideration for screen readers and keyboard users. So again, you may also be thinking, I don't work with anyone blind. No one needs to use a screen reader. But have you ever had an employee that hurt their primary mouse hand and had to navigate now using a keyboard for a while because they couldn't use a mouse? Okay, That's where, again, some of that keyboard accessibility and accessibility in general can actually help. We also closed captioning. And this is, again, not only those for hearing impaired, but is helpful for many with any type of neurodiverse challenges, uh, or if the course isn't actually in their native language. A lot of people, myself included, will turn on the closed captioning just to help me with my retention. Well, step one is generating them. And in Captivate and Storyline both, they can automatically generate those captions for you. I will say with no matter where you uh, generate captions, always go through and double check. Step two is the placement and customization. And this can be done uh, in, again, the Captivate and Lectura as far as where you want to tweak where it wants to go. Step three from then would be the ability to adjust the size. And in Storyline, this can be a little challenging as rather than adjusting the closed caption text, you are actually adjusting or increasing the size of all the text in the player properties. Um, and sometimes I've seen the closed captioning actually be go below the screen content and you can't change the closed captioning font. So that's, that can be a little bit challenging, especially for those accessibility users. I was in a session earlier this week and someone else said that navigating the layers in storyline with a screen reader is very wonky or janky, I think was their term. And I completely agree. And in my mind, if you if you have to do, you build actually on slides instead of piling on those layers, that defeats some of the beauty of storyline. Uh, tabbing can also be a little challenging sometimes, again, depending on if you've set up, let me go back a moment, your reading order, which would also be that tabbing order. Okay. The last class I tested for some reason in Storyline and Captivate both uh, MBDA, which is the screen reader I use, uh, there's MBDA and there's JAWS. For some reason, it also stopped reading content after 100 characters. I was able to adjust that in MBDA to change it to 250, but it still sometimes would stop in the middle of items. So I had to click the down arrow for it to continue reading, and it might have been in the middle of a sentence. I'm thinking this is something to do with the behind the scenes, the ARIA coding, but I'm not really sure uh, because it's not something I've experienced in Lectura. So again, that could be another challenge with your accessible um, users. So again, I just want to stress there are many tools that claim to be accessible, and there was a lot of discussion on LinkedIn uh, in about this back in August 2022. Um, so you may want to go out and kind of just do some searches there. Um, but again, do your homework. Um, it's there are ways that you may pass accessibility, and I wouldn't say you'd probably do DHS Trusted Tester Pass, but you'll pass your internal guidelines, but it still wouldn't necessarily be a pleasant experience for your end users, and to me that kind of defeats the purpose, so um, something there. Also with Lectura for accessibility, anytime during the process of designing and developing, you can actually run an accessibility check tool. Now there's some off-the-shelf access uh, check tools too. And I just want to stress, please keep in mind, whether it's an off-the-shelf tool or even Lectora's tool, this tool should not be used as the final indicator in determining whether or not a project is Section 508 or WCAG compliant. There is no automatic tool that can fully accomplish what a person can do with a manual test. Um, so, you know, always do that manual test. Okay. All right. I'll continue on. Then we move into consideration four. Does the tool help with inclusion, translations, or localization? We are reading and seeing and hearing about this in the news a lot. Visually representing diversity matters. Uh, people realize, and this is supported by research, 
that the media influences not only how others see them, but even how we view ourselves. So adding diversity to a course seems simple enough, but we really need to avoid the trap of adding photos or individuals with just different skin tones and thinking we've accomplished inclusion. We need to make sure we have that full range of human diversity, which includes things like ethnicity, race, size, ability, uh, social economic backgrounds, gender needs, and so forth to be included, and some of the tools can help us search that a little bit more. And we can see again just some characters from Lectora and from Articulate. <coughs> Excuse me. Allergies. Um, the other would be um, um, the translation tools. So how does this work? I have screenshots here of both uh, Lectora and Storyline. And once the RTF file, which is a rich text format, has been exported, the file can then be sent to your LSP or your language um, translator language service provider, which handles the rest of the translation and localization. In some cases, organizations will need to send additional materials, such as videos, other multimedia, to be translated. Excuse me? Mm. And localized separately. The translation tool in Lectura, in here you can see we'd just select translate, you have a choice of whether or not you want to do an entire project, the current pages, chapters, sections, or just actually the whole project, either way. From there, it will export <coughs> your file. You would then send a document, whether or not it is a rich text format, which is what we're showing here. It could be an XLIF, which is your XML localization interchange file. Uh, it could also be HTML or Word. You're going to send that over to your LSP or that language service provider. They're going to then translate it. And this was the most challenging translation uh, that I did because it was translated into Arabic. Um, and then you would take that and you would actually, again, just do the import. So you do just the opposite of what you did. So you would go through, you'd go back to your translations. You would import, again, you would decide whether you're importing the entire project or certain pages, and I've screenshotted to uh, protect my uh, NDAs, and then we go ahead and click it and import that information in. Okay. One of the things I do like about Lectora here is there is the option here to increase the text box size if needed, because there are some uh, items like if you're translating into Thai, <coughs> translating into German, Things like that that you will actually need um, to take that into consideration for your text box sizes. Okay, we're going to do this. <laughs> um, consideration five, well, now that you've made the course accessible, again referred to as that inclusive design, uh, consider again that full range of human diversity. I've kind of already hinted to this somewhat, but we need to consider those learner demographics, the locations, the cultures. We know that learners retain more information when they can access it in their native language. But we also want the learners to be engaged, motivated, and truly relate to the content. So how can an authoring tool help with inclusion and localization? Well, as we can see on here, part of that is through some of the assets uh, that you go to look for. And I, this is probably one of the biggest changes that I've loved in development is I don't have to contact marketing or another department who has uh, subscriptions to some content. So much of it is now uh, available to us as e-learning developers or as developers in general. So what tools are here? Many authoring tools include visual items, the videos, images, cutout people, sounds, icons, and you can incorporate that into your project to help, again, visually represent diversity. While many tools provide these images and cutout characters, the big question I must ask is, can you filter down to, again, choose things by gender, age, ethnicity, country of origin? For the cutout characters, do you have the ability to search and sort by those items? Now, we can see on here, and there's a full comparison guide in the back of the ebook, uh, but from looking at this, we can see the Lectora images are 500 plus million. That includes images, icons, videos, storyline, it's about 100,000, but those icons, uh, those images, if you're not familiar, are actually free. 
through the Noun Project, Pixabay or Unsplash. So go out and take a look at those sites. Uh, and again, Captivate has over 100 million plus. It's hard to get their count uh, because again, it's a great library because it comes from Adobe Stock and there's just millions of items that are part of the Adobe Stock collection, which again, I've got a screenshot there. And this was showing, again, whether or not you can sort through them. When it comes to the cutout characters uh, for the assets, uh, there's over actually 1,212 individuals uh, within ELB and or the Lectora one for um, Articulate. When I did the count, I'd have to look in the book, but I want to say there was about 100, 200. So you don't quite have as many there. Uh, if we actually look at the actual poses themselves, we can see 115,000 versus 30,000. Again, Captivate's included in their overall numbers. And stock audio is available within Lectora and Captivate only. Uh, Storyline does not have um, those assets included. So, okay. So there's my assets showing. Um, trying to find the audio. So lots of audio. And again, I just want to stress that because I see a lot of people out there that will get audio uh, because they found it on the internet or they downloaded it. And yeah, you can't just do that. You really need to um, to respect, hopefully, just like we want to people to respect our intellectual property, we really want to uh, respect the intellectual property and not violate law, actually, uh, with audio and video and things like that, too. So that's one reason this is so important. Okay. Now, the other thing, again, continuing about that flexibility, and so consideration five is a big chapter in the book. Well, all the major authoring tools offer things like themes and templates to assist with your development. These templates can really vary in how they range from a single page layout to more complex interactions to a set of matching layouts with, you know, different overall design themes, depending on the project and the deadline that you have. A custom project um, organization template can really help you get to that finish line in record time. The challenge is sometimes those basic templates that support maybe rapid authoring may not be enough. So my question from here comes into A, how many e-learning templates are there? Because there's a lot of times you can look at samples of people's e-learning and portfolios and different things. And you can tell who the authoring tool is just by glancing because it's that same template used over and over again. So we can see the different numbers of the templates provided by the vendor. Um, the other, as you look at that, how many of those are accessible? and include things such as your, not just your linear where you're clicking your next, but your non-linear, interactive, um, gaming, just-in-time training and things like that. How many also not only are responsive, and by tr I'll talk a little bit more about responsive here in a bit, but are also uh, meet those 508 or WCAG guidelines, helping you again be accessible and inclusion, inclusive. I should have shown that picture there. Uh, many of the pre-built templates, uh, again, are designed with hopefully are designed with accessibility, meaning all the graphic elements have alt tags, tab order is specified for interactions, and so much more. So the question is, does your tool encourage the flexibility to not only use these, but also to create your own layouts and templates? Does it encourage you and allow you to reuse learning objects? And I will say this is probably one of my biggest time savers, uh, is the ability to create my own templates and to reuse certain elements. Um, and part of this has to do with the sharing and reusing content. I will say probably one of my favorite features of Lectora in general uh, is the fact that they have something referred to as library objects. And those library objects can every, be anything from a text block. Uh, so we've got a class note that, you know, that's literally word saying, I'm back from class, but I'm muted, uh, to, full bone pages or images or interactions. I've got a whole section on 508 because creating things like matching in 508 isn't easy to meet 508 accessibility. So after time, I've figured out a workaround, I save it as a library object so I don't have to either go back and look it up each time or remember how I did it. Let, let the tools work for us. So, and then how, allow how does it work with PowerPoint does it allow you to import PowerPoint and all three of them do but the challenge is with Captivate is the content can't be moved or edited it's basically almost like an image that it's a bringing over so you can't tweak it and adjust 
all the individual elements in it like you can in Storyline or Lectora. So because anything, a text image interactions, all of those things can actually be moved around in those two. Last one we think about flexibility would be software simulations. Uh, again, that also can kind of go into reusing, uh, again, just kind of a big time saver, uh, Adobe Captivate and Articulate Storyline. If you do a lot of uh, software simulations, they allow you to quickly record simulations in what they refer to as the demo assessment and training modes, or depending on which one you're using, the view try text uh, test. And both allow you to create software simulations in all three of these modes. So um, in that case, Storyline and Captivate um, win that one. So continuing on though with another huge time saver, and this is something I noticed because I teach part-time as mentioned at a college, and I notice sometimes, especially students don't seem to use this maybe as much as they could, and that is the quick launch toolbars. I loved when Microsoft first came out with this years and years ago and other places started um, using it. I am a firm user of it, and if you look at my quick launch toolbars in between Word, Excel, uh, PowerPoint, Lectora, Storyline, they all pretty much are in that same format, so that way I know quickly um, it takes time to build to set it up, but that way I know exactly, okay, roughly where things are in those quick launch toolbars. So do they have that ability? Uh, yes. And Captivate, I didn't have a good picture of it, uh, but they will, they, it's similar, okay? Uh, but with Storyline and Lectora, yes, they do have the quick launch toolbars. I will say one of the biggest difference here is with Lectora, uh, has the ability to create your own shortcuts. And this is something that um, uh, Storyline actually does, but it just, it, rather than do it here from the customize, it takes a, just a little more work to it. Uh, another thing we hear a lot of people comment on is they really like the timeline or page events, and they all three have that. So uh, fine here, it's called timeline in Storyline and Captivate, it's called page events in Lectora, so, but they all three actually offer that if that is your preference uh, in tool and how to do your developing. But then that takes us again to a little bit further with that integration. Another way to save your precious time and money is through software integration. And this occurs when all of your e-learning tools really work together harm harmoniously. For example, if you have a specific screen reader a screen recorder or video editor you work with. Like I personally, I love Snagit. Uh, I love the TextMess tools. And so I am able to go through and customize that in Lectora and say, you know, that's what I want to use for my images. For my audio, I really like using Audacity. And so it doesn't matter if there's something built in, I would much rather use that. That way I don't have to learn another tool in here. So can you actually do that integration into your favorite tools? Um, from my research, Lectora is the only one that offers that. I cannot, I've, I've heard that I might be able to a storyline and I've been going back and forth and I, we cannot get it to work because primarily again, it is, um, I'm guessing maybe because it's web-based, I'm not sure. If Think about integration. <clears throat> If you want to uh, integrate some additional things like branch track, uh, which is another great one for your scenarios, uh, that is something that can be integrated in. In addition to virtual reality, virtual reality has been around for a while, but it's really getting big here in this last three to five years. Does your tool directly integrate into uh, your software? Does it allow you to directly integrate into your tool? versus logging in elsewhere and having to export or import internal files, that could really be, this can really be a big uh, productivity boost. We'll also talk about integration a little bit later in chapter consideration nine for publishing, but one of the things when we think about virtual reality, and I know there were some LinkedIn comments this morning showing some great new virtual reality tools, and that's awesome. All three tools actually do allow you to do 360 images. But unfortunately, only Lectora and Captivate actually allow you to do 360 videos where you can actually use a VR headset, which I think is fantastic and takes it definitely up to that next level um, with fun, especially with the younger and younger uh, our audiences may be. So 
Integration may include additional things. ELB offers things like the gaming agency. So they actually have the actual licenses for things like Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, along with additional games that you can incorporate. And again, you don't have to go elsewhere to do it. Then to consideration six, am I going to outgrow my software? And this is the one that I'm seeing has some of these tools or people who have been using them um, become more experienced. We're seeing more and more of this where people have what I would consider to do simple things in their tool. They're having to do a lot of maybe JavaScript or HTML coding or different things. And it's like, well, you should be able to do that relatively uh, without, without needing those tools, but they're outgrowing their software. Um, so as you attend how-to webinars and you start asking questions on user forms, you'll learn new tricks and ways to publish your e-learning development or actually push it. At that point, you may find yourself outgrowing the more basic linear templates that are out there. And then really, I think this is where it becomes so much more fun. The exciting things about developing e-learning is dreaming up new ways to add interactivity to a course, make this information exciting. So if your authoring app is not flexible enough to let you develop these higher level cognitive exercises, your results won't necessarily be as amazing as they could be. Now, the other thing I want to point out is in 2021, there was a Pew Research um, Center survey that said over 85% of Americans own smartphones. That increases to 95% of Americans between 30 and 49, and 96 of Americans between the ages of 18 and 29. This is definitely higher percentages in other countries, and I've got a whole other session on that. But selecting an authoring tool with a strong, truly responsive design capabilities should be a top consideration. You need it to provide an optimal user experience across phones, tablets, laptops, and desktop computers, ensuring your courses can be taken really no matter where they are. The key question is, how do you create that mobile content in an authoring tool? Well, with Storyline, it's not responsive, but its player is responsive. And so we can kind of see from our image through here, it has a responsive player that can be used to view content on tablets and phones, but the content itself is not responsive. And so that's kind of that key term there. Is it, is it a player responsive or is it content responsive? The content can't be adapted or changed based on the view. It literally just shrinks things down, which often eliminates part of that accessibility and readability aspect. I know for myself, I've worn glasses since I was um, between two or three. I had the fun little strap around my head. Um, there are times I just can't do certain things on my phone because I, I, I have to either zoom up and zoom down. It's just because it just shrinks everything down. Now you can use Articulate's other product, Rise, to create mobile courses. But again, your design and interactivity options are more limited there because RISE uses things uh, like drag and drop blocks and pre-built layouts. For, and a lot, again, a lot of those have a lot of accessibility limitations. Um, Lectora uh, and Captivate both have responsive course design. And in that case, you actually design your course for your desktop first and then adjust it based on your view. Uh, and we can see on here, here we've got a desktop, and rather than be in that same format, so my image is to the right, depending on your view you want, you can move it around and it doesn't change it. So you really have the most control over how your mobile content looks by developing, again, that slide or page based on a course, or again, scrolling course, either way. Now, often you won't need to make adjustments because most, a lot of times the tools will automatically do it for you, but again, you can still adjust your screen width, your text size, all that kind of flexibility that gives you so you're in control. Extendability is often uh, sometimes referred to as expandability, and this is that software design principle that measures both the ability to extend the features and functions of a tool beyond its natural capabilities. And this is where I was saying this is kind of outside the box along with the level of effort required to implement it. So as a developer, this can be done over time without changing tools, but are you sacrificing the long-term ability to grow or your return on the investment of your tool and your training and the total cost of ownership for simplicity and speed? 
Uh, in an e-learning authoring tool, extendability is typically accomplished through, and I've got samples of the coding here, uh, widgets, plugins, add-on, custom code in HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, things like that. The degree an author needs to learn how to write this custom code, again, varies widely across the tools. Uh, there are certain tools that in order for it to work, um, I need to use more uh, JavaScript or HTML than I do maybe in Lictor or Captivate, uh, if I'm trying to do that same thing in Storyline. Now, uh, in a previous session, someone says that uh, JavaScript, we talked about the support, and it, a court, there's an article, they uh, they actually say they don't provide support for the JavaScript coding, and there's, there's all kinds of tips on that. Um, so JavaScript triggers can sometimes uh, interfere, again, with those course playbacks. So. And those are just pretty pictures of those codes. And I don't know, I know enough to be dangerous to tweak them. So consideration eight, how it does tracking and reporting work? Well, the newest standard for tracking learners is the Experience at API or XAPI. Some people still may refer to that as 10CAN because that was the project name. We're seeing less and less of that. But this is that specification that makes it possible to collect data about all kinds of things that the experience that the learner actually has. So really, in any course in your, uh, any activity in your course, a button click, a video view, the amount of time spent considering a multiple choice question, that can actually be recorded and documented with XAPI statements. So this gives you a lot more insight about areas your learners are struggling with and what content they're fully understanding than, again, just the previous of the SCORM uh, or AICC. So if your authoring tool supports XAPI, which the three we're looking at definitely do, um, you should be able to make those adjustments. Now, a couple things uh, that are just slightly different is, um, I had my notes, or it's referenced in my book, I don't know if I can remember, is the ability of putting those custom statements. So I know XAPI, again, do are those course starter templates, are the statements actually built in their templates? It would be a question I would ask. Um, are there additional statements that can be used? And I will say Lictor and Captivate, I know you can use additional statements besides the ones that are included. Uh, so do they have that custom statement ability would be a big thing. And one of the last things is how can you submit it? Uh, you definitely can uh, do submitting to um, additional sites, either through things like your Google Drives, uh, custom scripts, you can pull information from them too. So, almost done here. Uh, and again, you, if you all have questions, please type them in. Okay, what publishing options are available? Well, you definitely wanna verify what your required format is for your particular delivery platform. Most authoring tools will publish your project to SCORM, which is that shareable content object reference model or AICC, Aviation Industry, CBT Committee, uh, or again, XAPI. The package can then be imported into your LMS, which is that learning management system, or the LRS, your learning record store, I always call it system, but one of the two. And this will allow the learner's progress, again, to be tracked. So they all do that. Uh, as publishing options, though, there's a little bit different. Captivate, uh, again, this is 19. Project Charms is gonna be a little, uh, add a little more, has eight different platforms, Storyline 10 and Lectora 19, so they can actually publish two specific uh, LMSs, such as uh, Docebo, if I'm saying that correctly, um, Saba, um, some total health stream, some of those things. Uh, but the big thing a lot of people ask and may not necessarily realize, is there an ability to check things? And yes, with these, and Captivate is in the middle again of redoing it, so I didn't have a good screenshot, but Captivate has what they refer to as Review 360, so people can log in. Actually, they doesn't even have to log in. With a link, they can go through and actually take a look at your course, and then the same version of that is uh, Lectora has Review Link. I will say I like the Review Link aspect a little better in some ways because it is protected, so even if my link got out, uh, they couldn't actually have access to it without me adding them. And I do a lot of non-disclosure agreements or NDAs. And so we really, I, I love the ability that I can protect that a little bit more. 
In addition to, you can also draw on things, which I just think is kind of fun. So if they had, let's say, one to make an adjustment and, you know, one to circle something, they can actually select a drawing ability and they can draw actually on the screen and it saves it, which, again, I just think is kind of cool. Uh, the tenth one was what about the support and training available? Both novice and expert developers will benefit from access to readily available product support and training. Um, I've been using this stuff for years and, you know, still, you know, need support, can learn new things, things like that. So <clears throat> the software products usually come equipped with a knowledge base. <clears throat> or some other form of documentation. Some also offer an online community, which these three do, where you can interact with developers and designers, ask questions, get troubleshooting help. <clears throat> While some resources are definitely better than others, being able to reach an actual person at your time of need can sometimes be frustrating. So you wanna make sure there's a clear understanding of how the support tickets are handled, who answers them. There's very few companies anymore that offer on-demand phone support 24-7. Um, so usually what you see now, and it's pretty standard across the board, is a live chat, a uh, sales representative uh, who can assist, point you in the right direction, uh, email support, go online and look things up. Again, the communities in these groups are fantastic and you can look things up there. The big difference that I notice is, you know, I, I lived in Southern Louisiana for a while and they have a phrase called lanyap, which is a little something extra, Cajun French. and it's kind of like the baker's dozen, you get 13. What is, what more do they give? And I do like the fact that with Captivate and Lectora, there's blogs available. Uh, Storyline has some eBooks. Uh, when I did the last count, which was about a month ago, uh, Storyline had, I want to say 12 to 13. Uh, Lectora or ELB Learning had over 36. Uh, definitely communities, tutorial and user guides, they all have those, subscriber releases. Lectora and Storyline definitely have releases. Captivate, it varies, hopefully with the new Project Charm. They'll be updating those a bit more. The other is about official training partners. Um, Lectora has three official training partners, uh, Interactive Advantage Corporation being one of them. Um, I know uh, If You Ask Betty is the other one, and I can't remember the third. Uh, Storyline has one official training partner, and Captivate does all of their training internal. So. So when it comes to a comparison chart, this is just a really quick overview. Um, we should, again, the if you download the ebook, it is a page and a half, two pages, three, I can't remember how many it is. Um, again, you should look at the authoring tool as a long-term investment. So in addition to those current requirements, keep an eye on future uh, to see when searching for the appropriate system. It's often tempting to make a decision based on the requirements of those future projects but what will the situation be in a few months or a year or two years? Just because a company may not currently need mobile learning, gamification, accessibility, and or interesting unique courses doesn't necessarily mean that'll be the case in the coming year. So that, that's something to definitely um, look at. Uh, we can see each of these offer a 30-day free trial. The price uh, varies uh, between them. Well, Captivate uh, versus Lectory Storylines, the same. I feel like you get a lot more access and assets uh, with Lectora. The operating systems, um, again, Windows, um, Windows Mac, Windows Mac, um, desktop or online, both uh, type of thing. So, oops, oh, there was my screenshot there. Um, since this is sponsored, again, thank you to ELB Learning for sponsoring this. There is the link there for uh, my ebook, How to Select the Right Authoring Tool. And you can sign up for a free trial of Lectora and start building those courses today. And I actually finished with a few minutes to spare, Ravon. <laughs> nice work, Chris. Before we dive into questions, I do want to remind everyone that now is the time to get straight from the source insight. So don't forget to submit your questions. Great questions contribute to a great webinar. So don't forget to submit those and we'll make sure to try to answer as many as we can with the few minutes that we have here. Lastly, don't forget to register for the last episode in this series, VR 101, Facts, Fiction, and Testing It Out with John Blackmon, CTO, CAIO at ELB Learning. We are sending the link to the chat box right now. We understand if you need to run, just know that today's session is being recorded and you will get access to the recording and the slides within 48 hours. 
Alrighty, let's go ahead and jump into audience questions. This first one is coming in from John. John says, some years ago, Captivate required that every object had an ID that is unique within the entire project. Um, or, I mean, I guess this is more of a comment um, there. So thanks, John, for that input. Um, for moving on to Natalie's question, sorry about that. Natalie asks, are there any student pricing options? There are some educational pricing for not just students, but also educators. And I believe last time I looked, and it's been about 30 days or so, uh, they're usually about 50% off. And that's available again through Captivate, Storyline, and Lectora. So great question. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Natalie. <laughs> Moving on to this next question coming in. Um, are there educational or government discounts for any of these tools? Very much just like uh, the previous one. Yes, it, and I think the government rate may be the same as the education rate, uh, but I want to say they're normally about 50% off. So, and again, I would definitely reach out to the website. If it's not on their website, always ask. The worst they can do is tell you no. That's a very good point. Um, and I, uh, real quick, I will say you would need, uh, in most cases, you need an EDU um, email address. Uh, or a GOV or some type of government email address. So, <clears throat> Thank you for that clarification there. I do have clarification from John on his question. John is asking, in Captivate, must every object have a unique ID within the entire lesson? It is better for accessibility that it does so but a lot of times when you bring those in that's done behind the scenes um i know with a lot of the other tools now if you're wanting to name them like your page names and things like that it is better if they have their unique names again that's more of an accessibility term um i can if you want to reach out to me i can reach out to and i cannot remember the gentleman's name on project charm uh, and verify that uh to see if, if that's changing uh, with 19, but my my LinkedIn is there. There's my comp my business name, and you can email me from there, whatever. Uh, but we can find out more information, or I could put you in in contact with the gentleman with Project Charm for Captivate. That's a great question. I wish I knew the answers, but I don't know everything. <laughs> Thank you for that, and thanks for that question, John. Um, moving on to this next question here: Can multiple people use the same login and or work at the same time? Okay, um, how to word this. Um, technically, they probably can. Uh, I will say with all of the software I have ever run into, that is against the TOS or the terms of service, uh, that login IDs aren't supposed to be shared. Now, most companies have a version of it, a team version that you can purchase. And so that way they're actually given uh, different logins. But to actually share logins um, is normally against the terms of service and you know that's that's the last thing we want to do is get access to lose access to the tools that we use um, for our, our living so I, I would say no as far as you accessing at the same time with different logins again it it's it's not quite like Google Drive where you can see people working and moving at the same time uh, with Lictor online you do kind of check it in and check it out so and for this last one here, we have multiple attendees who are asking, Chris, if you can put that um, that URL code of your book back up, that last slide. Oh, yes, I sure can. Uh, so I can take a quick picture while we're doing our closeout here. Perfect. Alrighty, and with that, guys, that is all the time that we have for today. I want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, ELB Learning, for sponsoring this webinar, and another huge um, Thank you to you, Chris, for taking the time to give us such insightful thank information. Thank you so much.